Welcome to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show, a real estate investment program. Listen and learn how to use real estate to build wealth and passive income streams for you and your family. We bring you experts every day to discuss and answer your questions on everything from single family homes all the way up to 600 plus unit apartment complexes. And now, the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Welcome to the show. My name is Al Gordon, and as always, we're working on your financial freedom. You know, yesterday was a huge eye-opener for me. I had the opportunity to go to a multifamily apartment community that was being transformed. I got to see the before, the during, and the after phases all in a couple hours. My adrenaline was pumping because I was watching transformation occur. I got to see part of this project in its beginning stages. I mean, this thing was dirty, nasty, ugly. And when I drove up to it, I was, I was like, Bleh, this is gross. But David, the gentleman that invited me to come over to the property, because I was curious, I wanted, to, I wanted to see what he was doing with it. And he's a Lifestyles Unlimited member, and he said, sure, come on over. And I toured the property, and I got to see the good, the bad, and the ugly. And one of the things that David told me was that most people who looked at that property bolted. They could not see the potential of that property. All they saw was this giant money pit. But David, he saw it completely differently. And the reason why he saw it completely differently is because this is just another project in a long list of real estate investment projects that he has accomplished. I got to see him in action. I mean, he came to the property. He doesn't, he doesn't spend all of his time at the property. He has crews of people, people that are on his team, that go in and do all the work for him. They do the electrical. They do the plumbing. They do the flooring. Now he contracts for roofers. And he contracts for a couple of other things, specialty things, that it's just actually more cost effective for him to have a company come in to do certain work than it is for him to use his own guys. When I walked into the property, let's go back to that. I walked into one of the units he hadn't touched yet. I mean, they were, they were actually kind of using the unit as kind of a storage for all the materials that they were bringing onto the property, all the plumbing parts, all the electrical stuff, the door locks, you know, everything you, you would do, you would need to do the renovation. And when I walked into this apartment, it was bad. I mean, it was bad. There were broken windows. There were holes in the wall. Some, some walls were painted. Some had, I don't know, some kind of ugly wallpaper on them. And there was a stench. There was a stench in that unit. Now, there used to be carpeting in that particular unit. And they, they ripped all of that out before they brought all their materials in. And the reason they ripped it all out was because the, the carpet itself was soiled. And I'm not talking about somebody dropping a glass of wine onto the carpet. I'm talking about animal waste in the carpet. I mean, that's what, that's what this place smelled like. It had permeated. Now, it wasn't that bad when I got in there. But David said, man, you should have smelled it when I first walked in here. And I said, what did it smell like? He said, it smelled like money. And that's the key right there. That is one of the keys to success investing in real estate. Understanding what turns other people off. What makes other people go, yeah, man, that's, that's a bridge too far. I, I can't do that project. That's, that's crazy. That's, that's going to cost me a fortune. But see, David, he understands the market. He understands what it takes to renovate units. He understands what the marketplace is demanding. He also understands 
everything he needs to know in order to rehabilitate the property, whether it's the electrical system, whether it's the hot water heater, whether it's the roofing. And if he doesn't know, he's got quality people on his team that will give him the information. That's what a successful, seasoned real estate investor does. Now, I mentioned he was only at the property yesterday just to check on progress, see how things were going, and spend a little bit of time with me, helping me to understand some of the nuances of what he was doing. It was a great educational experience for me. There were things that I learned yesterday that I could just fill the rest of the radio show with the knowledge that I gained. But unfortunately, I can't just spit that knowledge out because some of it would be lost on you. Some of it wouldn't make sense to you because you, you haven't had the opportunity to educate yourself on how to invest correctly in real estate. If you want to go down that path, education is the first place that you got to stop. Stick around. We're going to get into some more info that you're going to want to hear. Welcome back to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. It's time to turn up the volume and fine-tune your passive income plan so you can create the lifestyle you've always wanted. Welcome back to the show. So apparently yesterday, when I was out and about expanding my personal knowledge base of how to effectively rehabilitate properties, something was going on in the stock market. I mean, I got, I got an email today from Loriana and she's a fellow lifestyles unlimited member. And she said, you know, I'm not sure if you've seen the stock market drama that went down the last 48 hours, but it's created an online frenzy. So I thought maybe I'd share it with you. Maybe you could talk about it on the show. And I thought I really have not been following the stock market. I mean, I, I, I don't invest in the stock market anymore. I don't put my money at risk in the stock market anymore because I want to be in control of what my money's doing. And then she went on to say this, this here's, here's the gist of what happened. Apparently hedge funds made short bets against what are called dying companies. These, these are older companies that have been around for a while and maybe their, their effectiveness for what they did as a business has transitioned to some other source. And when, when I say the names of some of these companies, you go, oh yeah, I get, I get what you're saying now. Places like GameStop, AMC, BlackBerry, Nokia. I mean, back in the day when my kids were younger, oh, by the way, my daughter turned 21 years old today. Yeah. So happy birthday, Jessalyn. But anyhow, getting back to this, I mean, I remember when my kids were younger, I mean, GameStop, that was the go-to place. You know, you had to be able to go in there and, and buy a game for your PS, whatever they had back then, PS3 or something like that, um, or your, your Xbox or, or whatever your gaming platform you played on. Well, nowadays, it seems like a lot of that content is, is being delivered online. I mean, you can download the games and stuff like that. You don't necessarily need that physical space anymore that's called GameStop. Now, GameStop's still in business. Don't get me wrong. They're still out there doing what they do. But there's a lot more competition for the products that they provide and how those products are delivered. AMC, I mean, it's movie, movies, right? Theaters. I mean, look what happened to theaters when we decided to lock down. Yeah, a lot of space going unused. A lot of space going unused. And leases in place. So, you know, companies like AMC, they had to figure out how to make good on their obligations while not generating any revenue. Oh, by the way, I think, you know, most of the movie producers kind of stopped doing what they do. So there was no stream of new movies coming out, you know, and everybody was locked down. You, you couldn't go to the, to the movies because you had to stay at home. So other services stepped in and provided that entertainment content for you. How I watch TV now is completely different. BlackBerry and Nokia, I mean, back in the day, they were the bomb when it came to devices. I mean, today, 
you know, Samsung and Apple seem to pretty much control the marketplace. They seem to get the best ratings for the best products. But back in the day when I was in the military, I mean, I remember I got to one duty assignment. They handed me a BlackBerry. And I was like, well, this is kind of cool. Until I realized that it was actually an electronic leash. And it actually made me actually work even more than I was working. Because now people could get a hold of me 24-7. And same thing with Nokia. Well, I think I did own a Nokia phone back in the day. Anyhow, so what was going on was these hedge funds that were out there were making short bets against these so-called dying companies. In other words, they were betting that the price was going to go down. I won't get into the mechanics of, of that kind of investing because I just don't like that kind of investing. I just don't. But apparently what happened is that there were a bunch of people in this country, maybe in the world, that didn't like the fact that these companies had were, were basically being kind of a attacked monetarily. I mean, you know, the, the, these hedge funds were banking that, you know, the prices were going to go down on these stocks and they would make money because the price went down. And I guess there were people that decided they would band together and cause the destruction of their childhood to be set aside. Yeah. So all these people like started buying the stocks and it kind of made the price of the stock go up, which forced the markets to close with the hedge funds having to make up the difference. And according to the research Loriana did, it looks like the short sellers lost something like $14.3 billion. You heard me correctly, $14.3 billion on GameStop stock alone. Boy, that's a hard one to say. You know, there's, there's something called Robin Hood out there. You know, I, when I was a kid, Robin Hood was a guy that you know, was living in Sherwood Forest and he was stealing from the rich and giving to the poor, which is probably not a good way to do business. But, you know, that's what he was doing. But anyhow, this thing called Robinhood is some kind of trading app that, that I hadn't heard of that had a, a part in all of this. So, you know, it made me kind of sit back and think about you and where you're investing your money. Are you invested in a hedge fund? Did you lose money yesterday? because you were invested in a hedge fund because everybody's betting that the market's going to go down. I don't know, but do you even know what you're invested in? A lot of you just believe in the concept of take money out of my paycheck before I see it, send it to whatever fund I'm investing with because my financial planner said to invest there and just hope that everything goes good, that you keep growing at a certain growth rate per year you know, seven, eight, maybe 10%. But what bothers me the most is that stuff like that actually occurs in the marketplace, right, wrong, or indifferent. Whatever happened with GameStop, AMC, BlackBerry, Nokia, that may have impacted your investments. Maybe you ought to take a look and see if you were impacted. But I will tell you this, while all that mess was going on yesterday, I was physically at a property going through rehab. And I was learning some of the nuances of the business model, getting to spend time with an investor who has gone before me. And I'll tell you what, I learned a lot. And one of the most significant things that I learned yesterday was the fact that David was able to put $300,000 to work on a property. And by transforming that property and driving rents to where they should be in the marketplace and providing quality housing, for people that desire it, he's going to get an incredible return. Stick around. We'll talk about that in the next segment. We're back with the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. We're here to answer your questions and help you become financially free. Welcome back to the show. So knowledge is power. And in order to correctly invest in, in whatever you choose to invest in, you need to be properly educated on how to do those investments. Now, when I was younger, I used to invest in the stock market. I did. I learned how to do it correctly. But the biggest challenge that I had investing in the stock market was really was twofold. First of all, 
I had to make myself available to the market. Now, I was living in California way back then, and the stock market opens at 6.30 a.m. Well, I was I was in the Army, so, I mean, 5 o'clock, we're out doing physical fitness training and stuff like that. So by, by 6.30, I could actually jump into my office before I went and showered, and I could, you know, take a look at what the stock market was doing. You know, back in those days, we didn't have all this neat stuff where we have accessibility on our phones. Yeah, I actually had to go to a computer to get the information I was looking at. But the other thing that I could not really control was what was going on in the marketplace. Some days, stock went up. Some days, the stock went down. And what I would attempt to do is understand why those movements were made. And I'll tell you, there's, there's a lot of guesswork involved with that. And if you're investing in more than one stock at a time, well, that's multiple entities that you need to stay on top of. And part of it is, you know, getting into their financials, looking at their 10 K's and their 10 Q's, which gives you a historical perspective of what happened with some guidance on what they're going to do in the next quarter or the next year, depending on what report you're reading. And then of course you go to the company's website, you look at information they're putting out. Of course, all of that information that they're putting out is, well, I mean, unless it's a real bad news story, and even if it's a bad news story, there's an attempt to mitigate damage. And I'd read news reports and stuff like that. I mean, I try and get all the information I could get on the company. But the problem was this. If something bad was going to happen to that stock's price, by the time I found out about it, it was already too late. The price had already fallen. It's like a hot knife cutting through butter. Or, you know, it's the concept of trying to catch a falling knife. And at that point, you have to hope that maybe you had some stops in place to protect you from really getting slaughtered. There are major, major institutions that invest or speculate in the stock market. These organizations have the ability to move stock prices. Kind of what was going on yesterday with that whole mess in the stock market. I mean, I was I actually jumped on a stock page because I was curious what happened. I mean, volume yesterday was twice what it normally is. That's usually a red flag. It doesn't have to be a red flag, but it could be a red flag. So if you're investing in the stock market, and I'm looking at a NASDAQ chart right now, I mean, this, this thing is going upward and to the right. I mean, it is growing. Values are going up at a pace that we have never seen in history. I mean, it's pretty significant. And you have to ask yourself this, do you have an exit strategy? Because if something bad happens, how are you protecting yourself? And is your retirement money tied up in the stock market? I mean, you might be seeing some pretty significant gains over the last year, but can those gains go on forever? I don't know because my life is not affected by the stock market. I'm invested in multifamily and single family properties. That's what I do. I mean, I went out to the mailbox before the show just to pick up my mail. Hey, and there was, there was mailbox money. And you're saying, mailbox money? What, what is that? Well, that was a physical check that was sent to me as a quarterly distribution from one of the apartment complexes I'm invested in, which, by the way, is currently up for sale. We've accepted an offer from a qualified, very well-qualified buyer who put a lot of money up front as earnest money to do feasibility on the, the property, to make sure that it's going to be able to perform the way they want it to perform. And that money went hard about a week ago. That means that the buyer backs out now, there's a big chunk of money. I think it's $200,000 that would be distributed to the investors if the buyer doesn't perform. Now, we're, we're pretty confident this buyer is going to perform because this asset meets their requirements for what they want for their portfolio. And when the property sells, it's probably going to sell, I mean, actually close escrow, I think at the end of March or the beginning of April. We're going to get a very healthy return on our investment. And that's just one investment that I have. I have more. I don't have one. I have more. I'm currently invested in 420 units of multifamily properties. And I own three single-family homes as investments. That's how I'm investing my money. And I'm making money five different ways, technically six ways, in the multifamily space. Which takes me back 
to the conversation that I had with David yesterday. After the radio show, he asked me what I was doing. He said, hey, man, I, I don't want to you know, beat up on your time or anything. I'm like, dude, what do you need? He's like, well, I'm going to go take a look at three other properties that I've been renovating. And I'm actually getting ready to sell these three properties. So I want to go through and just do kind of a walkthrough on all three properties to, to basically create a punch list for what needs to be done to put these properties on the market. And I said, man, I, I got, I got nothing, man. I got nothing to do. I mean, when you have the opportunity to go hang out with a multimillionaire and go drive to different properties and to talk about each of those actual investments, you should jump on it because you can learn a lot. And I learned a lot just hanging out with David, driving around San Antonio for a couple hours after the radio show yesterday. Now, I think the most important thing that I learned before we went on our tour of the single family homes that he was getting ready to sell, David basically told me that he was going to double his money on that apartment community that I was at yesterday. His all in is under $300,000. And when you leverage that money, you have less of your money in play. You're using other people's money, which dramatically increases his returns. Now, if we just assume he was doing this all cash, doubling his money for all cash, imagine if he was leveraged, and he is. Stick around. We'll talk about what that means. Welcome back to the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show. Now, let's get back to your map to financial freedom. Welcome back to the show. So we're talking about returns. And, you know, some of you might want to make the argument that if you bought into the NASDAQ, and let's say you timed it right. I mean, you you waited until, say, March of, I don't know, third week of March, right around when the NASDAQ was kind of hitting its lows. And you, you put all your money to work right then. I mean, you knew how to time the market. Yeah, trust me. We don't know how to time the market because at that time period, we didn't know if it was going to keep falling or not. But that's about the time period where, where it kind of bottomed out around the third week of March. And the, the NASDAQ then was trading as low as, I don't know, $6,600, call it $6,700. And if you look at where the NASDAQ is today, it's actually at around $13,473.47. That's what my chart just updated. So you could make the argument that you could sell today and you could effectively have doubled your money. Actually, you would have made more than double your money. But here's the hard part timing that. And the other hard part is the greed. Should you sell today? I mean, look at what happened yesterday. Was that a hiccup or what, was that just an anomaly in the marketplace? I mean, half the room thinks one way, half the room thinks the other way, right? What if it's going to keep going up? Do you just keep holding or do you, do you keep putting stop losses in just to protect yourself so that if the sky does fall, you can sell all of your positions? I don't know. It's kind of an anomaly. I don't know where I've actually seen the stock market do crazy doubling like this. I mean, now, if you're invested in the stock market, I hope you do well. I really do. I want everybody to be prosperous. I think that's part of the American dream, the opportunity to create wealth for yourself and your family. But you're not in control of that stock market outside of the stop loss you might have put on. Or the fact you have a crystal ball that works better than everybody else's. Now, yesterday, I walked through an investment that's going to double David's money in a year. And he doesn't have to sit behind a computer or watch his phone and hope the market doesn't crash. He has his money working for him in a property. And here's the other neat thing. When I said he's got $300,000 into the deal, it's not necessarily all his money. You see, he can leverage the acquisition and repair costs of that property because he knows how he's been taught how to do that by lifestyles unlimited. And because this isn't his first rodeo, so to speak, he has garnered great experience 
with investing in these types of properties. And that's part of the reason he could walk up to this property where 99 people out of 100 would have, would have pinched their nose and walked away. And he walked up and he went, smells like money. I got to buy this right now. So let's talk about that return. If he's in it for $300,000 and he can sell it in a year for $700,000 because it's, it's based on a formula for how multifamily is valued, he would more than double his money. But let's say, let's say David didn't use all of his own cash. Let's say David used a third of his own money and two thirds of somebody else's money in the form of a loan. His return would actually be better because if he only put $100,000 of his money into the deal, he'd have a 300% return on his money. It's actually over 300%. Where else can you do that? Can you do that in the stock market? Yeah, I know there's things like puts and calls and you can do margin and leverage and things like that. Real technical stuff that if you're not careful, will fillet you. But what David's doing, it's all calculated. He's in control of everything going on. He's in control of his crews. He's got great people working for him. And because he buys and renovates a lot of real estate, he keeps those people employed. So there's a little bit of loyalty there going each way. He knows where to buy materials. He doesn't overpay for materials. He doesn't pay full retail for materials. He knows how to get discounts. And he learned how to do that through Lifestyles Unlimited. He also knows the marketplace. He's got a firm grip on what properties can rent for, what needs to be done to the properties to generate the amount of rent that they can command. He knows how to screen residents. He picks the right people for his properties while following all fair housing laws. See, yesterday I got to walk through something that's going to put an extra 300000 or more into his family's pocket in a year should he decide to sell. If he decides not to sell, that's okay. He can still operate the property because he's still getting cash flow off of that property. He can put long-term financing on that property once he gets it remediated and he gets it all leased up. And it's not going to take him very long. I mean, people in that area are noticing that property is being worked on. It's going to get attention from potential renters, from people that live in the neighborhood that are happy to see that eyesore transform, who might know somebody that maybe wants to live near them. It's a lead. David told me he's already had something like 50 inquiries on the property. 50. And he hasn't done anything to try and generate those inquiries. Now, I wanted to get to our little drive that we did after the radio show. I went to three different houses that he owns. One of the houses he bought for $40,000. Now it's in an, a neighborhood that is gentrifying. In other words, the old stuff is being renovated into like new stuff. And when I drove down the street, I saw that. But he bought this property for $40,000. He dropped about $30,000 into that property to get it renovated. And he put a resident in that property. He's held that property for about three years. In the meantime, that area has been on fire. The comps that we looked at yesterday indicated that, that property has a fair market value of about $300,000. Now, the resident came to the end of the lease, decided not to renew, which is okay with David, because he had his crews go in and basically fix it up for sale. We walked that entire property. We kind of did a little punch list. There were some things that the guys missed. That's not a problem. I mean, that's just the way it is. So when I got back into the truck with David and we started talking about the numbers, he said, do you, do you know why I'm selling this? And I said, uh, cause you got a good capital gain on it. And he said, well, that's part of it. But here's the other thing. $300,000 properties don't make the best rental properties. The property has priced itself out of the market for good rental returns. So it makes sense for him to sell that property, pull the money out of that property and go buy more real estate, wash, rinse and repeat. So if you think about it, if he makes $300,000 on the sale and he's got $70,000, let's just say it's all his money. He's getting about a 430% return on his investment over a three-year period. And that's just one house. And then we went to two other houses and we had the same type of conversation. I'm telling you, knowledge is power and surrounding yourself with like-minded individuals is the way to go. And if you want to get started, if you want to learn how to do this correctly, go to freeworkshoplivestream.com. That's freeworkshoplivestream.com. And remember, it's not the money, it's the lifestyle.
The Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show is for entertainment purposes only. Please consult a professional regarding your personal investment needs. Nothing presented on the Lifestyles Unlimited Real Estate Investor Radio Show constitutes an endorsement recommendation, offer, or solicitation to buy or sell any product or security.